come to the work. Father, we just echo uh, the prayers as Ashley's just prayed for us as we turn to your word, that you'd be pleased to speak to us, Lord, that we would, uh, Lord, see from your word the things you want us to learn, Lord. And uh, Lord, we pray that you'd, by your spirit, apply, Lord, what you've prepared beforehand, Lord, to our lives and where it's relevant, particularly to us and where it's relevant to the people we know and, and the fellowships we belong to. Lord, we pray you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for this message this morning, I want to consider the words of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, if you turn with me there, uh, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. Acts chapter 20 uh, is where Paul calls the elders of the church at Ephesus. Uh, we see that in it various things, both what Paul has done and said to the church, for the church, what his desire and prayer is for them, and something of his priorities. So let's uh, read from Acts chapter 20 from verse 17. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called to him the elders of the church. And when he had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God, faith and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, Behold, I know all, all of the, you, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify you to, to this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on your guards, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. Remember that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. Now, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build, up, build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. They, he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him grieving uh, especially over the words which he had spoken that he would not, they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. This message uh, partly comes from a concerning trend that I've seen. It's a trend that some in the church have started abandoning the church. 
and following after online quote unquote watchmen. People who themselves are also outside of the church in the main and spend much of the time bashing the church, even what we might call the remnant church. Friends, the church of Jesus Christ is God's purpose on earth. Some churches need to return to him. Some, it is apostate. Some are genuinely seeking to follow him as head. What I want to do is look at this passage because in it we see Paul's heart for the church. But also we see his behaviour towards the church, how he helped and served them. This is a biblical example of what a watchman or a shepherd is. It matters to us first and foremost because we are part of the body of Christ, the church. We need to watch our attitudes and our heart towards the body. But we also, also because our chief concern in IFB, our number one priority in prayer is the church, to pray for the church. I believe in looking at this passage, it will help us to pray in a right way for the church. Paul describes his term with this church in Ephesus and the first thing he talks about, this great apostle, this one who had such knowledge and revelation and understanding in the, from the Lord. What does he say in verse 19? Serving the Lord with all humility. Serving the Lord with all humility. He is serving both the Lord and the church in all humility. If you look at some of the titles that are banded about in some churches these days, whether it's the established church with the most reverend archbishops, we won't get onto the Pope's titles, which are truly awful. But in Pentecostalism, we see uh, bishops and super apostles. Paul prefers the title bondservant or slave. Even if we don't go in for titles, how is our attitude? Are we humble? Are we teachable? Are we subject to one another as we're commanded to be in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21? Sometimes we can pray for the church or talk about the church as if we're coming from a place of perfection. Paul's ministry to and service of the church comes from a place of humility. You read how he writes to the church at Corinth for the Galatian church. Clearly these churches had some big problems. And yes, he has some strong words, but it's an appeal, and an appeal in love and grace. The way some, particularly those who stand apart from the church, talk about her, it's just condemnation and disdain from a place of pride. It was never this way with Paul. In verse 19, it talks about with tears and trials. Do we weep for the church? James Lloyd Williams prayed, Something of this about praying for the nation last night. Are we grieved, deeply grieved, for those who have been deceived, for those who are falling short? Those who serve in churches know of these te tears and trials that Paul speaks of. Watching people fall away, seeing division cause so much damage. If you tell me you're a watchman, let me see your grief, your pain your heartache for his bride. A watchman is part of the church, not separated from her. In verse 20, we read, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. See, Paul begins, by, begins with how he served them humbly, with tears, and because of his love and service to them, he told the truth the whole truth. He didn't leave bits out that might be culturally insensitive or unpopular. There were clearly things that he said that were unpopular because he says that he didn't shrink from doing it. it suggests that it would have been uncomfortable both for him and for them. Friends, when we tell people the truth about sin, it should hurt us and pain us. I'll tell you why. Because we are all sinners. We all fall short. When I hear some people talk about homosexuality or other matters that are areas which they don't sin in particularly, 
but they speak with such condemnation. Friends, it should hurt us, because with the best of intentions in the world, we are all guilty to some degree of hypocrisy. How's your thought life? How's your love for the brethren? How honest are you really? Do you put a good spin on things? Do you get jealous? Have outbursts of anger? I could carry on the list until I hit something in your life and mine. Confronting sin in the church, which is what we're talking about, should be done through humility and love. So he told them it all. He didn't shrink, shrink back from it. We must do it, but it will be costly. And it shouldn't come from a place as if we do not sin or as if we are standing in a place where we do not, aren't, do not have problems in our own life. It comes from love from grace and a recognition that we all sin and need the salvation of the Lord. Verse 21 talks about repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God. It's God we are offending. We all encounter people who think that they're not doing much wrong, that they are good people. And by the world's standards, they are. But it's repentance towards God because it's God's standards that we fall short of. This wasn't a come to Jesus, he'll make your life better and give you a free guaranteed ticket to heaven. The only way into the kingdom of God is through repentance. Thankfully, the word says that the kindness of God leads us to repentance in Romans 2 verse 4. But if we leave out repentance, a proper understanding of it, a turning around rather than just being sorry, but if we leave it out, we certainly haven't shared that whole truth. We've left them without the essentials. In Hebrews 6 verse 1 describes repentance as foundational and elementary. And from verse 22, we see that Paul is on his way to trouble. Paul didn't go looking for trouble, but trouble often found him. He knew of the cost and he was willing to go through it. But he always sought the Lord. Sometimes he moved on when there was trouble. Sometimes he went to a place knowing there would be trouble ahead, like in this situation. But he always sought the Lord. Some seem to want to go looking for trouble. And some seem to want to avoid any trouble at all costs, including keeping silent. We need both wisdom and courage. And boy, is that a hard balance to find sometimes. But Paul seems to have it. I'm sure it's because he was so surrendered to the Lord and followed what he was saying closely. Verse 24, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. We see an echo really of that willingness to lay down his life for the gospel, to make Jesus known as a priority of his life above everything else. Friends, the church is the best vehicle for taking the gospel out for equipping a group of people to share in that call upon our lives, to be his witnesses. Verse 24, he continues that, so that I may finish the course of the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus. Here we see his willingness to follow the call of the Lord on his life. We need to endure. We need to know what the Lord has or is calling us to and to endure. Because it's not about how we start, it's about how we finish. Verse 24, again, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. How much is the gospel a priority for us? All of us have different particular callings on our lives. Clearly you feel you've been called to pray for the nation. That doesn't mean we set aside sharing the gospel. Paul is telling the elders at Ephesus at this time, reminding them of this important part of the work of the church, sharing the gospel of the grace of God. Then verse 25 says, And I went about preaching the kingdom. But we also see it's about preaching the kingdom. The kingdom of God is much 
so much of Jesus' teaching was about the kingdom of God. The gospel is for the unbeliever primarily. Although we remember it, we consider it, we share about it, we encourage the communication of it, but the kingdom of God is about much more. It's about the whole expanse of God's plan and purpose. The church is the kingdom of God, and it should be the reflection of it on the earth. So if that's the case, how we need to pray for it, to be challenged about the way we talk about it, because it's Christ's church, that which belongs to him, with all its faults and its failures, with all its weakness and waywardness. We don't know who God includes in his church, as opposed to that which is cut off and apostate. Sometimes it's clear, but we have to be careful. It's the Lord's bride. If we have a problem with it, let's take it to him in prayer and ask him to sort it out first. And as we pray, we will get a better sense of whether it belongs to the Lord or not. Discernment doesn't come from people telling us who heretics are. You need discernment from the Lord, not from man. Unfortunately, men sometimes have issues with other men, other teachers, personal vendettas. Test everything. Check out everything. Because the last two years has taught me a painful lesson. But people lie, even those who claim the name of Christ. Some do so knowingly. Others lie, not knowing that they're lying because they trusted the word of a man. God is not a man that he should lie, we're told in scripture. Test and check everything and pray for the kingdom of God. After he expresses how he's not likely to see them again, he warns them what they should expect. And again, he says in verse 27, for I did not shriek, shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. I've been challenged in thinking about this recently. In the church, we often see two positions. There are some churches that focus, that don't focus on and don't talk about end times at all, the, about the end times. It's not on their radar. It doesn't get a mention. This is obviously not declaring the whole purpose of God particularly given the days we live in. However, there's another position where almost all the teaching is about the end times. Much of it's speculative. It looks at events in the news and it says, this is a sign and this is a sign and this is a sign. It means we see the Antichrist system everywhere we look. It can become an unhealthy obsession. Like I say, teaching on the end times is important. But if we're teaching the whole counsel of God or the whole purpose of God, it should only be a mi minor in size of what we teach compared to everything else that we should be covering. It's the same with Israel. Some churches don't teach about Israel at all. It's wrong. It should be taught and understood. But equally, it shouldn't be the major part of our teaching. It's a danger of going to a Messianic fellowship in the UK because it's mainly filled with Gentiles who rightly love Israel and have a heart for her. But it's only part of the whole counsel of God. Sometimes in those places, it's a, it's, it can become almost an idol. And I'm not knocking these things. How could I? We teach both issues in our church. We teach about the end times. We teach about the importance of Israel. But it must be in balance with the whole counsel of God. We must not get out of balance. There's so much in the word that we need to cover. Here again, Paul is speaking to the elders and he says in verse 28, Be on your guard for you yourselves, for yourselves and for all the flock. They had to watch themselves and their fellow elders first, but, uh, but also for others. Let's just add further on in verse 28, it says, among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. How does the Holy Spirit make someone an overseer? How should this operate? First, the witness of the local elders. Ideally, there are already some in a church. Secondly, the witness of that body, 
the local body. And thirdly, the witness of other shepherds who know the man. And I say man deliberately, as that's what I believe scripture teaches. All the directors of IFB have been elders in a local church. It's important. How can we speak more broadly about the church nationally if we have no experience of oversight locally? Unfortunately, there's a growing trend for people to get their teaching from the internet. Now, receiving extra teaching from ministers who are serving in a local church can be useful, but you should still be part of a local body. I very much share what Ashley was expressing in the message we shared. If you haven't listened to it, again, check it out. But sadly, some are checking out of churches and then listening to messages from people who have also checked out of churches, who aren't under any authority and accountability. One such individual who has an online platform, generally of attacking other church leaders, who seems to be quite popular, he met another believer and married her in secret, secret and slept with her and then sent her away. And no one had any idea until it was exposed. This is why we have to, uh, to be accountable in a local fellowship for all the challenges and difficulties that may bring. The other part of verse 28 says, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Friends, do we love the church of God the way the Lord loves it? He purchased it with his own blood. For sure, we'll never quite get there. But do we love the church? Do we pray regularly for it? I know for some of you it's hard because your experiences haven't been good. You feel let down or that the churches around you are not what they should be. But friends, you and I are not where we should be. We haven't arrived. We've let our brothers and sisters down. While you were here, to IFB talk about problems within sections of, that call itself the church. I never want you to think that there aren't many good churches around this country because there are. Sadly, so often it's the figureheads of the denominations that are getting it badly wrong. But friends, I know good Anglican churches. I know good Methodist churches. I know good Baptist churches. Everything. Everything there won't be to my taste. I won't agree on every point of doctrine. But Christ has died for these churches. And they are faithfully seeking to follow and honour the Lord. The internet is not a church. Let me say that again. The internet is not a church. The one thing is clear from this lockdown. Church should be done in person. It was an absolute joy to meet together last weekend in the church building for the first time after so long. Paul tells these elders to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased at such great cost. Then he gives the warning in verses 29 and 30. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come, not sparing the flock, and from among yourselves, or your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. These are problems within the church. Uh, when these wolves come from outside and from inside. What if you're one of the one of the few left with discernment who know the scriptures well? When these people come either externally online or with their books or inside the church seeking to gain a following after themselves. Who will warn them if you've checked out? Maybe some of the elders will warn. Well, who else will be able to say, yes, these men are right because it's written this. This seeking to gain a following after themselves. Do you know how this is done? Look at Charles Taze Russell, who started the Jehovah's Witnesses. Look at Joseph Smith, who started the Mormon Church. Look at David Koresh, who started the Branch Divis Dividians, the Waco cult, or Jim Jones. You know what they all said? Let me quote something about Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith claimed that Jesus told him to join none of the existing denominations because they were all wrong. You know how to seek a following after yourself? 
you say everyone else is wrong. You just tell everyone that all the churches are wrong. They all use the same tactics. Friends, the problem is obviously a number of leaders of the denominations are saying things wrong. They're all wrong things. They're picking the wrong side of debates. But the Lord has his church and it's not on the internet. It's in the towns and the cities and the villages of this nation. Faithful folks who still value God's word and have it as a supreme authority. Don't follow any individual man out on his own, or woman for that matter. It's a dan the most dangerous place you can be. Don't go out on your own. The Lord's purpose is the church, which he purchased with his own blood. He doesn't have a plan B, not because he's not prepared, but because he will have his bride. Paul says to them in verse 31, therefore be on the alert. And then we have verse 22, now I commend you to, the, to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. Among all who are sanctified. We are called to be among, in fellowship with others who love the Lord, as imperfect as they and we all are. Then they prayed and wept together. They prayed and wept together. I don't know whether you can picture that scene. This is fellowship. Seek the Lord to lead you to a place where you can get together with others and pray and weep and rejoice and share your struggles with them. A place where they, people really love the Lord, even if they're still learning. Where they want to do the right thing by the word of God, even if they don't always get it right. Why is that important? Well, let's see what Jesus says to this church years later. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Jesus speaking to the angel, or it could be the elders of the church at Ephesus, the messengers of the church in Ephesus, right? The one who holds the seven stars in his hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men and put to test those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you left your first love. Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. They were standing firm in the truth. They had endured its wonderful start. But they had left their first love. Friends, let's never lose that first love. Never let the concerns of the nation, the concerns over end times, the concerns about the church, distract you from this first and foremost command to love the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And then to love your neighbor and particularly your brother and sister in the Lord. I just want to close by reminding you of some words from other scriptures that should remind us how, of how important the church is to the Lord. So Paul speaking in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Again, the same church that he's talking to in Acts. And in Revelation, the Lord was talking to. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle 
or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. The great lengths and care the Lord has for his church. He's not finished with his bride. He will have a bride. Then in 2 Corinthians 11 in chapter 1, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Again, Paul speaking, it's time to a church with lots of problems. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. But indeed, if you, you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that, that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Paul was never interested in getting a following for himself. He wanted to help prepare a bride for the Lord. Such love or complete recognition to whom the bride belongs. The church doesn't belong to the elders or those who speak a lot on the internet. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, the Lord Jesus in a place, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. The Lord Jesus speaks in a place of surrounded by idols of false gods and demons. And he declares this. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. We can trust the Lord Jesus with the church. But let's add our prayers to his because we know he prays for his church. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you that you will have your bride. Lord, we thank you that you're not finished with us. We thank you that what we see in the church in the UK, in the church across the world, Lord, we thank you that it's not your finished work. We thank you that one day you will have a bride that is ready. Lord, we pray that we would be good cooperative sheep. Lord, we pray that we would pray faithfully for your bride. We pray that we would have the same heart you do. Lord, we pray that you'd help us. Lord, where we've had bad experiences of the church, where we've seen its failure and weakness. Lord, we pray that that wouldn't cloud the way we pray for your bride. Help us, Lord, we pray. Teach us by your Holy Spirit how to pray for your church in a way that honors and glorifies you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.